Hello everyone and welcome back to Baby Got Booth. I'm your host, NBD Rez, and today I'm here with Twitch streamer, Dungeon Master, and voice actor, Marcel Howard Jr. How you doing today, man? Hey, I'm doing real well. How are you? I'm alright. <laughs> Today's been really busy. Yep, same. I'm glad to be here though. Thanks for having me. Oh, no problem. I, I wanted you on here for a while. If anyone recognizes his voice, he actually played Genki in my silent voice video. And if you haven't seen my silent voice video, please, I worked really hard on it. You did an amazing job. That thing is is jam-packed full of great info. Did you watch it all? Yes, I watched the whole thing. Oh, okay. It was an hour. I didn't think it'd be an hour long, but it was like, okay, it's an hour long. People might like dip in and out. I give it chapters to make it a little bit easier, so. That style of video is getting real popular on YouTube where like, like the video essay or whatever. Yeah, it's been like, a, it's been around for a while, but it, it ebbs and flows depending on what's going on. It also depends right. on like, because apparently I released it around the five year anniversary of that movie, so mm. I think it gave it a little bit of hit. It's not like big, but like, I don't know. I, I consider every video an investment because you never know when a video could like blow up. You could tell watching that video that you were passionate about it and you wouldn't care if that video got ten views or ten thousand views. You just wanted to put the video out, and that's what makes a good video. True. Like I, I always aim for if it blows up, I want to be good. But I always make all my videos good, no matter if I think I'll get 10 views or 100 views or a billion views. Yeah, a lot of people make videos specifically for views, and a lot of times you can tell, you know. And it's yeah. like that. you're you're gonna burn out on YouTube if you do that. So instead, you should just make videos about things that you're passionate about, like what you did. And you know, if it goes off, great. If it doesn't, you're still proud of what you've done, and you're happy with it, and you're, you feel like you didn't waste your time. Of course. It's a very fine line between wanting to make the videos you want and making it in a way where you it could get some attention. Like, it's a delicate balance. You could easily just sell your soul and make garbage and get a million views, and if that's your prerogative, fair enough. But, you know, I'm on a side where it's like, I want my stuff to be for me and for people like me. So, I really have course, no issue yeah. with that. But this is about you, of course. Uh, why, don't you introduce ah, you <laughs> why don't you introduce yourself a little bit for the people? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Marcel. I, as you mentioned, I'm a Twitch streamer and a dungeon master. That's where I kind of got my start on in the online space, at least during the pandemic. Um, long ago, long before Twitch.tv was even a thing, it was called Justin TV back in the day. Really? And uh, I used to play League of Legends on there. That's actually how I got partnered on Twitch. <laughs> Um, you old school. school. <laughs> yeah, real old school. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I got partnered back in like 2014 um, doing that. And then uh, I took a long break to finish college, get my education degree. And now I'm a teacher. With that, I came back during the pandemic because I had a bunch of downtime and decided to do something I love, which I discovered in college, which was Dungeons and Dragons. I started making Dungeons and Dragons shows on Twitch and uploading the VODs to YouTube. Just kind of telling stories with with content creators and friends and I uh, had a lot of fun so uh haven't done anything crazy lately I've um, just been sending in lots of voice acting auditions and working as a teacher is, takes up most of my time so uh, with that though I was I was really happy to be a part of your project so thanks for having me oh it's not no problem like one good thing about the pandemic was one pretty much the only good thing was if you had downtime and wasn't destitute you could really dive back into your int interests which look some of us luckily got to do absolutely like I, I really started dedicating myself to my um youtube channel and everything during a pandemic because it's like i graduated my it was my last it was my last semester i went on spring break and never went back to school <laughs> <laughs> oh my god graduating yep. in the beginning of p the pandemic was just it was a confusing time for everyone especially me i mean i can imagine like i can't yeah that's Having your graduation year be the same year that the pandemic starts, that a little frustrating, I would imagine, because it's like you, you spend all that time in person and then you just like you don't get to graduate with your friends or like, I don't know, experience like graduation parties and all that kind of stuff. And I don't get that money back for not going to school for half, half a semester, but it's whatever. Right. I'm not mad. Come on, Joe. Get rid of some of that. So anyway, um, so I'm, I'm going to ask you a few questions. First one, um, I want to focus on the more voice acting realm is do you have an artistic background that kind of led you to your voice acting uh, interests? Uh, artistic backgrounds, I mean, I was extremely into drama uh, in high school and college. I was in an improv group in college and in high school I uh, performed in all kinds of plays and things like that. 
Um, so I've always been a, a bit of an actor, and that's the main part of voice acting is is acting. You can you can do all kinds of different voices and accents, but if you suck at acting, then uh, voice acting probably isn't the thing for you unless you do a lot of practicing. Yeah, I think a common theme so far is that a lot of the voice actors I've interviewed so far started out in drama or improv because I guess that's that's a very natural I think path to that field I would agree I would agree I think you need to be comfortable embarrassing yourself mm -hmm. if you're going to get into voice acting well yeah because you're literally like in your own room with one to five people staring at you in the in a professional field of course of course in the lower field you might have like parents partners or neighbors listening to you in your closet screaming at the top of your lungs to exactly. try to pay the bills <laughs> exactly i was just gonna say people don't really think about that right it's like they'll they'll hear someone doing a voice you know for an anime or something and you like a lot of times that voice i'll just give you an example like if i'm doing like a little, a little goblin character and i've got the voice like this if someone's watching me do this, I'm all, I got my hands all cooled up and I look like I'm freaking crazy, man. Like, if I'm doing this voice and you're watching me do it, if I was embarrassed doing that, I wouldn't be able to do it. You know what I mean? You you have to be able to do that in front of a director mm -hmm. who's, who's judging you <laughs> based on <laughs> how good that voice is. And you've got to be able to do it with confidence. Because a lot of the time, it's like when you, when you do anything, there might be a twang of, is someone listening? or someone judging me, but you kind of have to honestly accept that at that point, that people might think you're weird, and you know what? They're not doing what you're doing. Exactly, and if you're, yeah, if you're worried about people thinking that you're weird, I think voice acting is probably the wrong, wrong profession. Like, especially improv. I think improv is the most, hmm, how do I, how do I put this? Cringe inviting activity a person can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. There is a ton of bad improv that I think there honestly there's more bad improv than good improv because improv is a very 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 uh, quiet um desired but not always have skill and improv is one of those things too it's like it cultivates like you said and cultivates embarrassing environments which is kind of the point I think that it's really healthy actually <laughs> like I think it's a very healthy very healthy hobby yeah, especially when you're surrounded by other people who hopefully are just in as you are. That takes a little bit off of it. Like stand-up exactly. stand is another one where it's like it could easily go bad, but you're by yourself with a ton of people, maybe a ton of people just like staring at you. But then improv, you're surrounded by other people who may be better, may be worse, but you're all just trying to have fun. Hopefully, you know, trying to show each other up because improv is a very much a uh, team effort. Yeah, there's uh, actually a rule that goes along with improv, at least when I was in college, um, and we were coming up with the rules for our improv group, one of the main uh, rules is you're not the funniest in the room. Mm -hmm. And like, to remember that, it's a partnership when you're up on the stage with somebody. You share the spotlight with them. You don't steal the spotlight from people. Really, that's good for any kind of job or hobby. You're not the best in the room. Or you're at least, you're at least not supposed to think you're the best in the room. That, exactly. That, that's very one egotistical and very stagnating because you always want to learn from people around you and you think they're the best you're not going to take any lessons from anybody exactly and so where does that jump you into voice acting like around what time i guess well um i started voice acting as like in my i'm sure you hear this a lot from voice actors in my closet mm -hmm. uh surrounded by clothes to insulate the noise <laughs> uh and i did that in my third year of college over a summer and then after that so that this would have been coming up on eight years ago and then after i got a taste for it by uploading auditions to casting call club and there was actually a another site called behind the voice mm -hmm. that used to have a casting call section for people to post jobs. I don't think it's it's around anymore because I actually went looking for it about a year ago and like looking for my old auditions because I really liked some of them and I couldn't find any of it. It was all deleted. I could be wrong on that, so don't hold me to it. But yeah, uh, Behind the Voice Actors is actually where I first started uploading stuff and then Casting Call Club was next. And uh, I did that. I kind of fell out of it for a little while, came back, fell out, came back. And then finally during the... Um, pandemic while I was on Twitch and kind of gaining some popularity again and meeting content creators and going on shows 
I was told over and over again, you've got a great voice, you're great at doing characters, you should do this, you should do that. And so I was like, hmm, I guess I will actually invest some time and some effort into this voice acting thing and see if I can actually make it happen. So I ended up uh, investing into a bit, of, a bit of a better audio interface, which is like a big step for a, a voice actor. Um, your audio, Your audio interface and the computer and the like location that you record in are all way more important than a microphone true um so i ended up using a 200 hundred dollar microphone in a closet surrounded by clothes with a really nice audio interface and that ended up getting me a lot of my first jobs my first paid gig uh was recorded in a in a um closet my second paid gig was recorded in a hotel room surrounded by uh <laughs> by uh couch pillows so those are the softest um, pillows you're gonna find so i wouldn't true I, exactly you gotta take some of those with you next time you go to a hotel and just like stuff them in your suitcase just so you have some, a little bit better insulation <laughs> yes yes um when I think everyone that's a voice actor starts off, in, not everyone, but most people start off in a similar situation of like people telling you you've got a great voice or you do great characters or whatever it might be. And that's great. That's wonderful. But you also need to be able to tap into acting because it's called voice acting for a reason. And I, I tell the people this a lot because whenever I tell someone I'm a voice actor, a lot of times I would say maybe... I don't know, four out of 10 times at least, someone says, oh, how do you get into that? I do a lot of great voices or like, I love doing accents or, oh, I feel like I could do that. And it's it might be true. They might be able to do that. But a lot of times their association with voice acting is, oh, I can do a cool voice. Mm -hmm. That's great, but that's not voice acting. That would be maybe better for Dungeons and Dragons or something like that. Whereas voice acting... Like, you've got to be able to read and memorize scripts. You've got to be able to physically match your body to a character. You've got to be able to match lip actually flaps. act. Yeah. So I went on a tangent there. My point, I guess, is that Tangents um, are very drama. welcome. Tangents are very welcome in this podcast, please. Okay, perfect. The less I talk, the better. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, all, all my point there was just to say that um, it started with acting and a love for acting, and then it moved into people inspiring me, telling me I should do that, like should follow this, and then investing into the art, investing into an uh, audio interface, investing into a better location to record. I built a audio vocal booth from hand. It cost me like three thousand dollars worth of materials. Ooh. I built it in my basement over the course of like five years. It's where I do all of my recordings now. It's seven foot tall and six feet deep. And it's got my microphone in there and it's got a um, ventilation system and it's completely sound soundproof in there. And, you know, I spent all this money doing that. And fun, fun fact, I'll tell you a little funny thing. Spent all this money doing that. Spent all this time doing that. I was so excited. I go in there to record my first um gig and because it's so quiet in there you can actually hear my laptop's fan <laughs> and it ruined the recording <laughs> so then i was like well can i cuss on uh, can i curse on you yes Probably please <laughs> I was like, well, shit. I was like <laughs> picking up my laptop. I'm like, you MacBook, you 2018 MacBook, you're useless. So I had to go out and buy a 2020 MacBook with an M1 chip so that it doesn't have a fan. And now the recordings sound amazing. But it was like, it was like, oh, I'm so set up. I'm so ready to go. And then I record this thing and it's like the fan is like. It's always the one thing you miss, the one small thing, because honestly, you're so used to your fan at that point, you, you don't even comprehend it yourself until you listen back to recording. Exactly, exactly. I actually had a director tell me, is there a way you can turn down the fan in the room? And I was like, there is no fan in the room. Oh, crap. <laughs> it's my laptop. <laughs> so that's your setup now. You just have your own kind of booth, pretty much, where you can record your auditions and gigs. Yes, that's correct. I have uh, 
A microphone that I invested a bit more money into. I got a, a Neumann TLM 103 microphone, which I would not recommend people get as their starting microphone at no, all. No, do not. Nope. Um, and then I have a, also an audio uh, a UA Apollo X, which is also an audio interface I would not recommend getting as your starting audio interface. You were very experienced. You're <laughs> So you're allowed to have all that. Right. Everyone else, if you're just starting, um, don't don't dig too deep into your pockets. Exactly. Yes. Invest in your space. Mm -hmm. Invest in your space. Um, insulate your space with like sound insulation. Find a closet or an office or wardrobe, a wardrobe or anything that you can stand comfortably, stand or sit in comfortably that has a lot of sound insulating materials, and you can sound better than most just from that. You can use a Blue Yeti microphone in a closet surrounded by really insulated clothes. And if you're good enough with your audio processing, you can sound just as good as me with my $5,000, you know, setup. I will agree with you, but we are anti-Blue Yeti on this channel. So I gotta <laughs> say, disclaimer, don't get a Blue Yeti, please. My backstory is I had, I had a Blue Yeti, like everybody, had it for a year, broke for no reason. I was gonna buy a new one, but that's all channel saying, don't buy a Blue Yeti, get an XLR mic, cause they sound, they're always gonna sound better. I'm like, you know what? Yes, cause Blue Yeti, I think it's a toy pretty much because it's so big, but there's nothing in it. So it looks fancier than it is. Oof, now I'm going on a tangent, anti-Blue Yeti tangent, but. No, no, I'm with you. The reason I brought it up there is because it was the shittiest microphone I could think of. <laughs> anti-Blue Yeti. Blue Yeti slander is very welcome here. <laughs> that said, if you have not a lot of money and little blue blue yeti is what you can afford, then you know get get it. Or you know what? I have heard some people on TikTok, believe it or not, I've heard some people on TikTok recording on their AirPod mic or their like you know uh, Apple earphone microphones in a booth, and they sound great. So okay. fuck it. Okay, no. okay, use that, but not a blue yeti. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you probably had those already. Exactly. So pretty exactly. much your, the space means you can pretty much use almost whatever and you'll sound nearly professional. Exactly. It's more about the no the outside lack of outside noise and the quality of your of the quality of your voice rather than like the quality of the mic really. Exactly. And and disclaimer, I am not in my insulated booth right now. I sound like trash because I'm in my office with no insulation. There's all kinds of echo and I'm using a $100 microphone. So just keep that in mind if you're if you're judging my voice based on what I've been saying. This is not my this is not my recording setup. Well, you still sound fine to me. Oh, well, that's good. Better than my space and my big ass room with blank walls on my eighty dollar microphone. <laughs> and my I think my fifty dollar audio interface. It's one of the cheapest ones you can buy. See, for a Blue Yeti, you can get like an okay mic, like eighty dollar mic, fifty dollar audio interface. I think the mics usually come with XLR cables. If not, they're like ten bucks. So just Look, look before you leap, Do, spread your options around. It was just get the Blue Yeti because everyone else has one. Right. I mean, if I was going to recommend a, a microphone and an audio setup, there's a, a microphone called the Stellar X2. And it's about $150, I think, last time I checked. And I know it may sound like a lot to someone who's on a budget, but you're getting Neumann TLM 103 sound level quality with mm -hmm. that microphone. They're, they're, um, custom made by i can't remember what the company's called is audio not audio technica i can't remember um but look up the stellar x2 microphone uh it, it's it's great quality neumann level quality it's handmade they make them to order and it's like 150 bucks and then get a scarlet focus right audio interface and record in a freaking closet and you are gonna book jobs if you are good mm-hmm of course, again, acting ability very much counts over quality. Of course, <laughs> you can be of the course. you got the clearest. I gotta disclaim that with you if you're yeah. good. <laughs> you can have the clearest audio in the world, but if you can't act, you're probably not gonna get the gig. We can't say you're never gonna get the gig because, like, well, hey, you know, a professional gig, no. But you go on Casting Call Club, oh, yeah. and you are not a great actor, but you just like doing voices. You are gonna book jobs if your microphone just sounds better than everyone else's. Because <laughs> yes, you got, you got yes. like eighty people submitting <laughs> things that are like. My name's Pinkie Pie, and I like it. <laughs> and meanwhile, you're like your audio just sounds slightly better, 
and you're auditioning for this little, little My Little Pony thing, you know, you're gonna get the job. Oh my god. What was it? For, for the one I casted you on, I think I had like 150 something submissions. And yeah, you're right. There were some where it's like, you're trying your best, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> yeah. And like, honestly, if you're talking about like from a casting director point of view, um, from a caster point of view, because everyone wants to be casted, I guess that's the right grammar. But a lot of people don't know what the caster point of view is. And really, it's really up in the air depending on what the person who's casting wants, at least from my point of view, because everyone has a certain idea of what it sounds like in their head. But I can, but honestly, that can change if the right person audition because like, oh, that voice is cool. I didn't think about that, but that yeah. could actually work. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I was uh, just recently cast for a job. Um, the script for the audition said to read the character um, in a way that was that they were depressed. And so I read the character, but I ended up like their, the description for their voice was um, like 60 plus years gruff country. Mm -hmm. So like a cowboy. And I read the script in a like smoker's voice, like, like this the whole time. Okay. Like, like he, like he's been smoking. Um, I, that's not my, that's not exactly how I did it, but yeah, yeah. similar to that. And when I got an email back from the director that I had been cast, he, he mentioned that he liked my rendition of the voice, which was different than what he had expected. So doing something a little weird or a little off the wall is great. Mm -hmm. I listened to a interview with Matthew Mercer, which I do all the time because he's my idol. And he says... He's everyone's idol. Oh, yes. We love Matthew Mercer in this house. We love Matthew Mercer on his channel in his life. We love Matthew Mercer anyway. And he said well, one of the main things that you can do is just make a choice. One of the worst things you can do is just kind of go along and not really feel out what you're trying to do. If you think it should be this way, then do it. Because you get multiple takes anyway. So you, yeah. So just make a choice. Don't half-ass anything. Because it's better to be good but not what they're looking for than to be perceived as being amateur or not that good. Oh, absolutely. It, it's possible that I audition for this, uh, we'll just go back to that country role, right? 60 plus years country guy. And I voice act the character, I voice act it like, like this, I voice act it like this. And maybe that's not what they're looking for, right? But they like that voice and they go, oh, this, I don't like it for this character, but I like you for this other character. Or you make a choice somewhere in there that catches their eye. Maybe you you laugh in between a couple of the lines or you add an ad lib or you slightly change one word on the script um, because it just feels right in the moment. Those kinds of changes can either really help you or really hurt you, but the worst that can someone, that a casting director will do is say no. Mm -hmm. So it can't hurt to try something weird because like you said, and like Matthew Mercer says, you make a choice and if it's not right for that role, the worst that can happen really there is like you stand out in a different way. Yeah. Like us directors are never going to come back and roast the shit out of you for your audition. We're too busy no. for that. No, they're not going to email you back and be like, your audition was trash and you should stop being a voice actor. No, you're just not going to get an email back. <laughs> and, uh, and another thing you said was when you do an audition, you forget about it because um, worst, yes. case scenario, worst case scenario, you never hear back and you just forget about it. Best case scenario. Send the audition and forget about it. Yeah, it's a great surprise. And honestly, and that applies to everything else. Pretty much any artistic field where you submit yourself. Because that's hard to do for everybody. For voice actors, actors, editors, videographer, videographers, everybody. It's just, you make a choice. Do what you do what you want to do and what you feel is right. And just send it. And whoever like it is going to like it. And again, I always say, you're good as you are. But always try to be better. Yeah, absolutely. You should always be trying to improve. Mm-hmm. Which is why I take lots of classes, lots of voice acting classes. Yeah, that's why I'm always editing and always doing uh, voice voice directing or trying to. So, next question relating to the roles is, what kind of roles do you like to take or do you audition for a lot? <laughs> I love uh, creepy gremlin goblin-y characters. Those could, are by far. I could tell. <laughs> by far my favorites. Um, some of my favorite roles that I've had, I voice acted in a fan dub for Mortal Kombat and I played Reptile, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, those kinds of characters, like creatures, are my favorite by far. Um, close second would probably be like a 
any kind of fantasy roles or, or roles that are like, you know, I'm a Dungeons and Dragons guy, so if I can, if I can voice a staunch knight or something like that, then, you know, I'll do it because I just love those kinds of voices. I just, I don't know. Those, those are, those are me for sure. You got a lot of practice playing D&D, I bet. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Of course. Of course. It's clear you have a great range and you can do voices and act because back to the acting thing, I think a lot of people, when they think voice acting, they think The Simpsons where... You have like, I don't know, five people doing a majority of the characters and they're like, well, they're just doing voices. So I could do that. I can do a Schwarzenegger or I can do a Homer Simpson, but you're not, I forget who plays Homer Simpson. You're not him. Dan Castellaneta. Dan Castellaneta. Thank you. You're not Dan yeah. Castellaneta who has, I don't know, probably 30 plus years of experience and is probably one of the most prolific voice actors of any generation. So... Because, again, he's an actor, I think, first and foremost, than just Homer Simpson. Because he does other right. things, too. Uh, kind of related to that, do you have a favorite role you've taken so far, if you're comfortable saying, I guess, you don't want to hurt no one's feelings? No, no. Um, honestly, I have a lot. Like, I get really invested in all my roles. Mm -hmm. So whether it's it's Genki for you or um, the shadow character I played on AFK Arena's anime or um, even just the, the Venom or not Venom, a uh, reptile fan project that I was a part of. I have a lot of love for just moments in those, you know, in those stories, whether it was like one specific, you know, five second line that I was just really proud of, or just the whole character in general. I love all of the characters that I play. And I think that's also an important piece that's kind of maybe unique to me. I don't know if this is unique to a lot of voice actors, but I get very invested in all of the roles that I play and I take them very personally, which may not always be the best thing, but it helps me get into those characters better yeah. when I am invested in them. Yeah, nothing wrong with pride in your work. So it sounds like you're more into the certain moments in a particular job. Like you're like, I'm glad I had this job, but it's not the job itself. It's more like what I get to present for this job that really means exactly. a lot to you. Exactly. I... My, my goal is when I voice act for, for someone, I want them to feel like I have added something to their project yes. or given something to them. Always, always, always good to have because any, anything like this is a collaboration. So you want to feel like you're not just filling in a box. You're trying to, like you said, add something to the project because it's a collective of ideas and talents. So you really want to rise it up. Exactly. And... I think that should be the bare minimum for, for someone who's getting into voice acting is you should want to add to projects. Your goal should not be to necessarily just make money. Like, yes, making money is great, but you're in a space that's a creative space and whoever's casting you has a dream and an idea just like you do. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to look at it because you could look at it purely from your point of view where it's like, I need a job. I'm going to apply the job. I got the job. I'm going to do the job and I'm gone, which again, for some projects is okay, depending on sure. how, because everyone has different levels of passion for a project. Some people are just sure. doing it for money. Some people are doing it, doing it for fun. Some people are doing it for say their demo reel portfolio or something. But yeah, I think it's always good to put your best out there and really, really again, collaborate. Collaboration. Someone I interviewed before said, you're not going to get very far in any artistic field, especially this field, if you're not a team player. Every project that you get into with voice acting is a collaborative effort, like you said, and you have to have enough respect for a director and for your fellow cast members to do your best job and be passionate about it. Just like improv, bring it right back. You're not the smartest person in the room or the best person in the room. So I really want to touch upon um, your D, D experience because i think um again that's kind of part of your brand right sure yeah absolutely so again or back to origin story stuff where does that kind of interest come to come into fruition and how has that like kind of stayed with you throughout your life right now um sure i'll uh i'll get a little deep on you i'll give you some drama yeah for your podcast we love it uh <laughs> so um when i was in college I was going through a really rough time period. Um, I'm not sure what was happening. I think part of it was I had just kind of started blowing up on Twitch 
And then I took a break and started to kind of dislike League of Legends, which was the thing that was making me very popular at the time. I started disliking League of Legends. I think a lot of people So I, I branched out and started making content for Smash Brothers, and I started making content for Dota, and I started making content for other games that I was interested in. And my YouTube channel spiked downward. It, it crashed. Mm -hmm. I stopped gaining subscribers. People were unsubscribing. My videos went from 10,000 views to 50 views. And this happens a lot. Uh, to people on YouTube. Yep. But I didn't know that. Uh, I didn't know the ins and outs of the business or how to do anything. I just thought, oh, well, these people are here for me, right? They're here for me, so they'll watch anything I put out. No, they were not there for me. They were there for League of Legends content. Um, that's, so That's every YouTuber's mistake, thinking you get... Like, if you have one video that gets, like, 20,000 views, and you're like, okay, I've made it now. Everyone, everyone is going to keep watching my stuff. And then the next thing gets 50 views, and then you get destroyed. Even though it happens to everybody, it feels like it just feels like a one shot, which you'll never get again. That's like that's a fear, yeah. right? That you're never going to get that kind of uh, response ever again. Yeah, and oftentimes we take it personally, right? Of course, even, yeah. Even though it's not personal. Yeah, because um, it's just what people want to watch. Even though it's our work, you got to think about. The people can't watch everything. Like you don't yeah. watch everything you're subscribed to or like, so exactly. It's 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 very hard. But yeah, continue. So from there, I was uh, I was getting extremely depressed. Um, I was starting to kind of fail classes, and I felt a bit like a loner because my roommate had just uh, dropped out of college and moved away, and so I was in a dorm room alone. And I just, I was very, very lonely. And so anyway, I was eating at the lunch hall at my university and I had a friend, uh, like an, more of an acquaintance, someone who I just kind of knew from improv, the improv group, they weren't really a friend, um, come up to me and while I was eating and they sat down with me and started talking with me and they started talking about their hobbies. We were just talking back and forth. I was talking about, you know, playing video games and things like that. And they said, oh yeah, have you ever tried Dungeons and Dragons? And I said, no, I, I don't really know anything about it. And they were like, well, we have a group on Sundays. Why don't you come and play with us? And so I took them up on it, but not not um, excitedly. It was just like, I'm going to go check this thing out. I'll probably hate it. Something, to, something to do. Something to fill your time. Yeah, exactly. And like, I didn't think that they would be like super welcoming of just like a random person. I felt pitied, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, and so um, anyway, I was planning that day to attempt my own suicide actually um and so that postponed it okay until after sunday because i had promised i would come mm -hmm. so um two days pass sunday rolls around and i go there are four four people there Two girls, two guys, all from the improv club. And I am the fifth. And as I come in, they all stand up from the table and they all do this weird hand symbol thing. <laughs> <laughs> and they they bow with this like this hand symbol thing, which is three fingers, three their 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 pinky finger, the ring finger, and the middle finger uh together. It's like a not Spock, but it's like the, the three fingers instead of the two split, it's the three and an index finger split. Yeah. Um, and they did this thing and then they bowed and I was like, oh my God, this is so nerdy. <laughs> but I walk in anyway, they got pizza out on the counter that they just ordered and they open up these books and we start talking. They're like, okay, so, you know, you've never played D&D &D before. Do you know anything about it? I was like, no. They're like, okay, here's here's the races you can pick from. And they were like pointing out the, the different original races from the original player's handbook of D&D 5e. And I'm looking through and I'm like, well, what, you know, what should I, what should I pick? Like, you know, I kind of like this, this, and this, but like, what, what can I do in the game? Because I didn't know anything about the mechanics of the game. And that's when someone said to me for the first time what D&D is all about. You can do whatever you want. Pretty, pretty much, yeah. You can you can do whatever you want, whatever you're excited about. So long story short, we spend uh, about an hour and a half making my character. Um, they give me a set of dice that they had an extra set of, so they, they give it to me, like gift it to me. Um, and the character I made was an elf called Zim, uh, X-I-M. Um, he was a high elf, a sorcerer, a wild magic sorcerer. Oh. And uh, Those are always his, 
exactly. And his whole thing was, um, he's his spell casting was like he was like a a, a failed magician, like a like an actual magician. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you know, flowers, bunny out of the hat kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and so he just he, every time he tried to pull a bunny out of the hat, instead he'd pull out like a crab or something that would like pinch him on the nose a or like a tarasque. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So he was that character, and and he had a silly voice that I put on that was. Um, Similar to if you've ever seen Teen Titans, uh, what's the what's the character that's like a magician? Um, oh, the Great Mumbo the, or something. The, the Great Kazoo or uh, I can't remember. I know his you're talking. I know you're talking about. Uh, yeah. But it was like that. He he talked like that the whole time. <laughs> you know. Oh my and, god. Uh, <laughs> I, we spent six hours that Sunday just playing. Oh my god. It's. I mean. Honestly, that's as, that's as long as a D and D game should be, but that sounds so long we're not in it. Right. I'm sure that time we're flies in college. by. That time we're flies in college. by. What yeah. else do we have to do? <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, not homework. So, exactly, exactly. But who's gonna do that? Nobody. So, <laughs> so we spend that time doing it, and I had the most fun I've had since I was a kid swinging sticks in my backyard with my friends. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so. From that moment, I fell in love with d and I fell in love with that group of people who are still some of my closest friends. It's it, like d and literally saved my life. Mm -hmm. That's the story of how I got into d and Yeah, that was, a, that was a fantastic story. I'm sorry to hear you went through such a hard time. I'm glad you found something to kind of bring you out of that dark place, which happened to be d and And I've heard it happens for a lot of people to where it's also very therapeutic to where you can just sit down and either pretend you're someone else or maybe even like kind of process certain feelings at the table through a character so it's not really oh, yeah. in your own lens, which I think fiction period is great for. Either getting away for getting away from your problems or addressing your problems in a different way so that it's easy for you to digest and really process through. You have you've touched on a great point and and funnily enough um, I think you've just given me a revelation which I've never thought about until this very moment, which is um, that character, Zim, the failed magician, is very much a metaphor for how I was feeling at that time. I was a content creator who, who had failed at the show that I was putting on. And that's what he was. He was a failed magician. Every time he went out on the stage and tried something new, it would backfire on him. And that's how I felt at the time. And... I've actually had people recently within the last few years like laugh in my face about how silly it is to have felt suicidal in that moment like during that time period no but no 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 that's I think never time for that ex I, I think you know not to mention there were some other things going on but the main thing in my life at that moment was my YouTube channel like that was the main happy thing that was going on for me mm -hmm. and having that start to fade or, or fail um, even when I went back to making League of Legends content, my views had been one-fourth the size. Everything had kind of fallen apart, and I felt as if I was fading into obscurity. It kind of felt like I was on a on a cliff edge losing my grip. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I don't think it was silly at all to feel that way, and I think a lot of kids nowadays feel that way when it comes to, you know, they're, I'm a high school teacher. I see a lot of these kids that want to be artists. They want to be TikTok like famous they want to be youtubers they want to be celebrities and watching their or, or listening to their conversations about likes and comments and how popular how many views their tiktok got or how many views their video got or um how many people are commissioning them for art or whatever it might be i think it's a very normal thing for someone who's a teenager or in their early 20s or even later to be caught up in the the mysticism and the the spotlight of being popular online, mm -hmm. and especially if you get a taste of that yes. at any point. Yes, Th that that taste, but that being taken away and you feel like you're unable to give it back is like one of the most terrible feelings you can have because it really makes you devalu devalue yourself and your talent because yes. now you're like, oh, I just got lucky and now just no one cares anymore. Exactly. And so I don't think it was silly at all for me to feel that way of at the not. time period, but I've heard people say that, and I haven't really had the 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 gusto or the balls to stand up to them and, mm -hmm. and say what I just said to you, but I think that that 
it's a normal thing. And I would caution anyone to, to stay as you have done with your silent voice video, stay within your passion so that no matter what, if you get 10 views or 10,000, like I've said, you never feel slighted or undervalued because you know what you've done is something you're proud of and passionate about, which is why now I'm so much happier. I make D&D content and my D&D videos on YouTube get 50 views, 100 views, maybe. And I'm okay with that because I love making them and I don't care if anyone else watches them. They're there as a time capsule for me and they're there for me and my friends who I play D&D with to relook at years later and those kinds of things. And the content is great and I would love for it to take off and I would be happy if it would take off. But I also have my hobbies outside of being online that keep me sane. That's very important to have. Which I didn't have at the time. Yes, you need, like, it's great to be on your grind and to be, work very hard on your craft and be passionate about it. But you do need something outside of it to take you away for even a day or something. Because it's so easy, especially for people who, like, work at home, like, content creators, to be on the grind, to watch videos about the algorithm, or to edit all night, or to come up with the most fantastic script and video ever. But... Again, burnout, I think, is something that's been very... It's been much more prominent nowadays because a lot of people are feeling it in life in general. But I think especially in the creative field because you see all these YouTubers, big YouTubers who are like, guys, I'm not doing well. Even though they have a million subscribers, they just feel like they can't keep up with it because it's become their life. And especially mm -hmm. when it starts to dip, then it feels like what you spent so much time and work on is failing. And since you have nothing else to kind of focus on, that's all you're going to focus on that perceived failure. And that's think one is one of the, especially when I hear you say that teenagers are going through this, because especially when we're that age, we want all the attention in the world and all the validation in the world. And to, to, to hear that they're so desperate to get that from the outside world is, it's, it's difficult to hear. And I think people, I think there needs to be some sort of, that program some sort of message of don't make this your life if it takes off great but make sure it's all about the passion the passion at, in the end of the day and i know it's hard to hear because again we all just want to hear how to succeed but you succeed by doing what you love and doing it all the time and showing it to people and that and the rest is just out of your control you can't you can't control if you get casted you can't control if your video gets a million likes to a degree so it's just about doing your best and again, learning and taking what comes to you. Absolutely. You know, imagine, imagine a situation where you are uh, on the grind, as they say, and you are releasing this trash shit content that you hope is going to get go viral and you're releasing 10 videos a day going, 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 making stuff that you're not passionate about and that you don't care about. There's two scenarios, right? One scenario is like your ideal scenario where you take off and you make a bunch of money and you, you know, you get famous, but you've got to keep making your shit trash content that you don't like making because that's what made you famous. So that's one scenario, right? The living hell. Yeah. Living hell. The other scenario is you've spent all this time making shit trash content that you don't care about and it doesn't take off. Both of those are shit scenarios that make you feel depressed and horrible about yourself. Mm -hmm. God, yeah, I can imagine because again, I think personally I can make shit trash content that's edible for somebody and get more attention than what I'm doing making making now. But again, since I'm so passionate about everything I'm making now. If and when it does blow up, I'll be like, okay, this is what I want to make. And it's finally getting recognition that I feel like, look on, again, I feel like it deserves. Um, and again, we don't always get what we deserve or think what we deserve. And again, that's part that's part of the content creator process. There's a, People really dismiss this whole content creator field, even though it can be, can be successful. But it's also like an underlying way of like just a mental anguish it can oh, often entails because it's so much of you in there it's another art like any other art and people just again 
dismiss art because again serves no proper function to society or what i've heard from uh, smart people i guess but you know i think it's one of the most mentally anguishing um careers you can pursue and i think there's respect in really being passionate about that i agree most certainly and uh yeah i i i think that art is extremely important if you're using it to actually express yourself and do something that you're passionate about i think it's really good for you all right we went on a very deep tangent on that but um we can head we can head a little bit back to the D and D, and so you you went through that game it saves your life and of course you decide i want to keep doing it right yes so where does the uh, online aspect of it come in I had been running D&D since that moment, uh, been running my own campaigns, writing my own stories, DMing, and I kind of turned into a forever DM after that moment, uh, <laughs> uh, which is okay. Um, and it just means you're so after, good. Yeah, exactly. And after so many years of writing stories and coming up with ideas and only having so many people to play with... Um, I decided during the pandemic to get back into Twitch streaming and uh, content creation. And so I decided to come online based on a, a, f a friend's recommendation. There was a, a Twitch game show, you could say, uh, called The Austin Show. Have you ever heard of it? The what show? The Austin Show. I don't think I have. Lover Host. I don't think I have heard of that. So there's a... Uh, I was told based on some funny characters that I had done on some previous just small shows that I should try out for this bigger show. Um, essentially, it's just a, it's like a dating show on Twitch that uh, people go on. It's kind of like reality TV, but over a Zoom call. And um, I went on to the audition, which was on a channel called Gondok. And Gondok was the name of the guy who runs the audition. That was like his username. And so went on this audition thing. I felt like I totally bombed it came you know got off the call that night and then got a message to come back uh that this guy wanted me to come back as an interviewer for the show oh yeah to help uh with casting people and i knew that um that was kind of my first step in back into kind of streaming and, and building a name for myself again so i i did that for a little while um it was a, a stressful and somewhat depressing time period just because it's a lot of like trying to sell yourself to people and get people to like you and notice you and you know trying trying to stay authentic while also you know exaggerating yourself in a way that gets you noticed yep, it's, yep, it's yep, yep. it was uh it, it was a somewhat depressing depressing time period but uh that was early pandemic and then uh I, through that process of interviewing people and being on that show, I met tons of content creators, tons of people, and I was the resident D&D &D guy on the interview cast. <laughs> so every time someone came on, it was either, you know, you've ever played D&D &D or you never have, and it's not like I ever brought it up as like a a question or anything, because that's not what I was there for. I was there for a job to interview them to see if they'd be good for the Austin show, but once in a while hobbies and interests and things would come up and they had been watching the show and they'd be like well i know that marcel does dungeons and dragons and yada yada and they'd mention something or they we'd ask them a question like what's something you've always wanted to do and once in a while they would say dungeons and dragons because at the time it was becoming really popular with stranger things and all kinds of other stuff and so every time i heard that i kind of marked the name down of that person it was like, okay, this person wants to play D&D. &D. Maybe I should do a D&D &D show. And over the course of time, I just started making connections, networking. It spent I spent about two years doing that. And then uh, 2021 hit, and I decided to actually take a stab at starting a show. I asked some of the people who I had met on this interview process that I had done to join me on it if they were interested. A lot of them were. So I ended up making three separate shows because I had so many people interested. Wow. And that was a Tuesday night show, a Wednesday night show, and a Friday night show, all of which had to be nighttime because I was a teacher. But over the course of time, those groups have slowly fallen to the wayside just because, as you'll learn, if anyone gets into D&D, &D, 
The hardest part about D&D &D is not fighting the bad guys. The ultimate villain of D&D &D is scheduling. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, oh my god, I hear that so much from like Reddit stories and YouTube where it's like just the scheduling of it because again it can it can go on for a while and of course people want to keep doing it but again life gets in the way so oh i get like it, especially when you got scheduled like i don't know three to six people it's insane yeah I bet. yeah i was doing the scheduling for let's see one group had seven so seven people oh one group God. had four people another group had four people so that's four eight Seven. That's uh, fifteen people. Uh, scheduling Ooh. for fifteen people a week. And content creators uh, and people think we don't do a yes. lot, but our schedules can get pretty crazy. That's correct. Yes, content creators are the most finicky people when it comes to scheduling. <laughs> um, I, I love a lot of my friends, but a lot of their schedules were complete dog shit. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, <laughs> like even a couple of them were like, "Yeah, I don't wake up until four p.m." It's like. <laughs> Can you wake up an hour earlier to play some D&D &D with us or something? No, because I don't go to bed till 7 a.m. <laughs> right. Especially different so, time zones, too. No one can get me started yep, on time and then zones. Content creators from Europe and other places. I had a content creator from the Philippines. Um, 12 so hours. So we had to work around those schedules. Um, so anyway, um, my, my Tuesday night show was called Out of Time. It was a great little show. It was about a group of characters who... We're in like medieval, you know, Lord of the Rings time period, and then they get thrown forward in time by a demon, very Samurai Jack. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're thrown forward into a time period where this demon has already won. Right before they defeat him, he throws them forward in time using this portal thing that he developed. And uh, they're thrown forward into, into like uh, 300 years in the future where he's already won. And um, from there, they have to find a way back into the past, and they that that was the the story, and it was a it was a good little story. We ended up doing I think forty episodes or so, and then uh, it it um we, it fell apart just because people had to drop out for different reasons, and yeah, um, you know it, it is what it is. Um, and then my Wednesday night show that was uh, that one's called Blood of the Immortals. It still is live. We've moved it to Mondays, and um, there are much less people on it. Started with seven people, we're down to three people. So we've dropped quite a few, um, but the three that are there are passionate and happy about it. Um, and that's a really cool show. It's about the, the characters of the story. The players are demigods. So their parents are uh, one, one is mortal and one is an immortal god. And they got some special unique powers based on which god they chose to be their parent. Very Percy in character ja creation. Very Percy Jackson. Yep. Very Percy Jackson. Exactly. Camp Half-Blood. Exactly. Um, and then... Uh, the story is that there is a, a demon again, uh, you know, demons is a classic, right? But uh, attempting to destroy all the gods, a la like Gore the God Butcher from okay. Thor. Uh, and these kids are attempting to recover these artifacts that their parents have been trapped in. Uh, and so they're, it's like a fetch quest slash um, Excalibur type beat. Um, and then uh, once they recover these artifacts, then they'll fight uh and i actually named him after gore gormok the the god slayer and so uh they are one artifact away from that that final quest uh to defeat gormok so that that show is probably going to come to an end here uh next year and see, then see this is why you're forever dm your stories are too good <laughs> everyone yes, everyone I've, wants I've you told. everyone wants you to everyone wants to play in your world so of course you have to be the forever dm you gotta you gotta pull back on the creativity my man <laughs> yeah well i mean it is what it is um <laughs> my friday show was called elegant evil and i specifically found four of the like the most uwu minecraft like cute cosplay streamers that i had met during <laughs> the interview process and made them the main characters of the show they all wanted to play and they are the villains of the story so it's a reverse oh. D, D story they're trying to summon a um like a, an entity that's called Mother, and Mother's going to bring about the apocalypse on the world, but make these four women the queens of, like, the realms. Or so she says. Right, right. And so it's uh, it's a story about them just being totally despicable. And, and, and it's so funny because these four people that were the main cast of the show are just, like, the cutest, nicest people you've ever met in your life. <laughs> and so... That show, unfortunately, uh, fell apart as well due to conflicts, uh, scheduling conflicts. No, um, it almost so I think fun. we got, yeah, we got like 12 episodes or something uh, out of that one. You got VODs? Um, 
Mm-hmm. You got VODs? Yeah, they're all on, on YouTube.com slash Marcel Howard Jr. You can wa- watch all of them. Yeah, I'm definitely going to watch um, those now. <laughs> it's a good time. And then uh, I had two other shows. One is still in the runnings. Um, both of them were eight episode short series. So specifically eight episodes and no more, no less. The first one is called The Haunting of Moonglow Mansion. And that one's finished. We finished that in uh, October of last year. And that was a story about a ghost hunting crew going into a mansion and trying to solve the mystery of the family that had gone missing in this mansion. And like, basically they were ghostbusters. They trapped ghosts and that kind of thing. Um, And uh, that was a really fun story I did with probably the biggest cast I've ever done. Um, I, I don't really need to name all of them. I'm not that kind of person, but I was very excited to have these people on and that they had they had wanted to be a part of it um i think their combined youtube subscribers was like i don't know like 12 or 13 million Ooh, um, boy so it was a good time and it was just a really fun short story that i had a lot of fun making and i feel like the players had a lot of fun they've told me multiple times that they've had a lot of fun playing it and they maybe want to do a season two so maybe that one will come back uh, sometime in the future when we get more time but again scheduling is just is just tough for people of course and then uh that's when i learned my first lesson of D content creation i guess this is for anyone in the niche audience of your viewers that wants to start making D content online my biggest lesson that i've learned is when you're recruiting people to play in your show um, if they're not already like your best friends and people who are committed to you, if they're just like people that you kind of know and are teaching or people that you want to bring on that are like people you want to collaborate with, you make your shows short and you give them a time period. Okay, this is going to be an eight episode show. I just need you to commit to these eight episodes. I don't need you to commit to a year long campaign. I don't need you to commit to this, this and this because um, that's how I ended up losing my out of time show and my Elgin Evo shows. Both of those mm-hmm. did not have a set limit. So they were just going to go on forever until they, the players, finished the story, which was, I guess, maybe taking too long for some of them because they just, you know, started to fall off and and not show up or uh, whatever it might be or lose interest because that that can happen. So when I made my Moon Glow Mansion show, which was eight episodes, and and from the beginning we had like cited it as eight episodes, then they knew exactly when it was going to start and when it was going to end, and they felt comfortable committing to those time periods. So. So that's advice I would give. And that was a, a lot of fun, a, a great show. And then uh, the last show is one that is currently on hold because one of our players is in Iran and has no internet because they've shut down the internet and there's lots lots of protesting and, and things going on there. Shout out to that player, wonderful person, um, hoping that they're safe. Of course. Um, we're waiting for them to find a stable location to live and have internet so that we can play again. With that, um, that show is called Path of the Crane, and it's one of my favorite little one-shot ideas that I've ever had. It's about a group of young monks who are protecting an origami crane, a sentient origami crane from fire elementals. And the idea is there is a portal that's open somewhere that is letting in these fire elementals, and the, the origami paper crane has the instructions on how to destroy that portal. Um, and so if those fire elementals are successful, in just burning that origami bird, uh, I don't know if I've been saying plane. I meant bird. If I if I said plane, it's an origami plane or er, bird. <laughs> but um, <laughs> anyway, uh, if they're successful in burning that bird, that origami bird, um, then uh, they they'll continue swarming this you know this uh, world. So these four young monks have to protect this this little very fragile sentient origami bird from these giant fire elementals. And it's uh, basically they're on the run kind of thing until they can figure out how to close the portal. So it's um, it's a good little one-shot uh, eight-episode story. I think we're four episodes into it right now, but okay. it's just on hold because of... Yeah. yeah, again, your stories are too good. See, if I was a DM, I'd be like, I don't know, fight some fucking goblins in a cave or something. You'll get some gold, and that's that's the, ep- that's the episode by. Because, <laughs> I mean, I've tried to DM before. I'm not very good at it, t- to be fair, because... I. I have terrible one. I have terrible memory. Two, I'm terrible at, at, at improv, which I think is essential to being a DM. Uh, like, very essential because players are just gonna do things you don't suspect, <laughs> and if you can't True. if you can't adapt to it, then yeah. But again, I haven't I haven't even played D and D because I haven't found a good group yet. But it's nice to hear that you have 
all these projects of varying degrees. Of course, you say some of them don't go through. But right. again, you don't let the fact that, well, no, one of your series, people uh, jumped off, dissuade you from keep keep trying. Because again, you found something you really like doing. So you're always going to take the chance to do it again. Correct? Yes. Yes. That's what it sounds like, at least, doing like, what was that, eight, probably nine campaigns, all different? Yeah. So um, I, have, I have a personal question, because even though I don't play D&D, I have a character in mind, which I need a, a DM's opinion on, what, what, which would work, if it would work. Okay. So it's a barbarian warforged, all right? Okay. Named Arthur. Back, uh-huh. Backstory, he was an elf, but he joined, he's a very smart elf, but he joined his country's military. And since he was very frail and his body wasn't up to task, he signed up for pretty much a super soldier program to where they take their souls and put them into Warforged creations. Oh, shit. And during one battle, he didn't die, but his circuitry stopped working. He, like, turned, he, like, pretty much um, went to sleep and wakes up 30 years later. And he has a girlfriend he loves back home, and he's very dedicated to his country that's changed a lot. Do you think that would work for a good campaign? So he wakes up as a robot? Yes, he is he is a war he is a warforged, the soul of an elf. And pretty much his goal is to get his body back now that the war is over. But of course, 30 years later, who knows what's happened to that body, but that's still his goal. And to see his girlfriend and family and village again. Oh, okay, so he's got a quest to return to his body and like return to his girlfriend and the people who were in his past but he doesn't know where they're at because mm-hmm. mind you it's 30 years later right and so like, okay. of course he would join the group to achieve this goal among yeah. others I guess so he kind of wakes up like uh, like Bastion from Overwatch like just covered in some like vines and stuff that and was, just like that was one of the inspirations like he kind of looks like uh, K2SO from Rogue One mixed with the Iron uh-huh. Giant with, yeah, the Overwatch backstory, pretty much. I love it. I would love a character like that in one of my campaigns. It, of course, depends on the setting. But yeah. yeah. I mean, if you ever have... If you ever need a Warforged in your campaign, just hit me up. Because my schedule is open as a bird. I will dedicate myself <laughs> to you. <laughs> All right. All right. I, uh, I have ideas for, for shows. Um, of course, during the school year, it's rough planning and starting things. But mm-hmm. uh, rolls when summer rolls around... You know, you you've known me just for this this one year or so far, so you don't know a lot about me. But once this summer starts kind of rolling around, uh, I believe we did our recordings during the summer. Yeah, um, it was like July or something. Yeah, that's when I have my most free time, which is why I probably auditioned for your thing. Oh, okay, go go. Good thing, good thing I did that then. <laughs> yeah, man, I couldn't have had a better Genki. <laughs> I appreciate it. I had a lot of fun playing Genki, and that that role meant a lot to me. I don't know if I told you that or not, but. Yeah, you met, you mentioned it, and again, hearing your story, um, again, please watch the please watch the video. More again, more more than my sake. I think anyone who's ever gone through what you have, and honestly, what I've been through, which is why I relate to that property so much, um, can get out of it. And there's it's very again, that's why it's so personal. Because again, I've gone through the same things you have, of course, in different ways. I'm not gonna say I share your experience exactly, but um, a movie like that that DI is so heavily in those themes. I think it was my D and D. It was my D and D. Something that kind of woke me up and kind of gave me some invigoration to kind of move past what I was feeling at the time. Of course, and during 2020, oh boy, <laughs> I don't think I was alone in that. But that was a hard year for me. So, and I very, I really appreciate you um, being so dedicated to that project. That means so much to me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had so much fun playing Genki. It was a cathartic experience. It was a, a good time and. Um, I, I'm really proud of the video that you've made. I think you've done a wonderful job. I, I think it deserves lots more views. And uh, even if it doesn't get those, you should be proud of it. Uh, I'm very am. And again, it could blow up any moment. But if it doesn't, that was a passion project anyway. So as we yeah. as we wind down, I have one last question. Um, so kind of going back to the voice acting um, topic, do you have like a dream role or a long-term goal for your voice acting career? Or is it still something on the side you don't really give um, too much of credence to? Uh, my dream is to voice in like an official anime. Uh, that that has always kind of been my, my big dream. I think that it's not far off. I just don't have the ability to just move out to 
um, Austin, Texas or LA or mm -hmm. New York where these like anime dubs are voiced in person. And so a lot of them are not taking online talent. Um, so right now I'm just kind of enjoying my life the way it is and doing it as a hobby. But in the future, my goals would be to make voice acting my full-time job. Of course. I've always wanted, since I started doing it, to make that the end goal. It's just very hard in the location where I live. I live in the middle of nowhere, Nebraska, which is just, you know, there's not options out here. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's virtual or it's nothing for me at the moment. Yeah. And until I'm able to comfortably move to a new location, um, I don't have the confidence to just pick up my life and go with uh, a few bucks in my pocket. You know what I mean? <laughs> of, course, of course. And I don't know, one day you might wake up saying, you know what? Let's go. You, you never know. Yes. But yeah, you're making a smart decision of like, I'm not going to move up just yet. Again, you're getting a lot of roles for that casting call club, which can be good, good decent roles. You don't have to be an animate. You don't have to be an anime to be considered a successful voice actor. Correct. So, correct. Because you're doing yes. this, you're, you're doing a smart thing of auditioning for roles that you can do of varying degrees. I bet you don't just do big stuff or small stuff. You're kind of all over the place. Of course. Because it's good for networking, getting your stuff out there, and practice and everything. Yes. So you're doing the right thing. Yes, and some of my best networking is like going and taking classes and learning more, oh, yeah. and, and you're just being better at the craft. Um, all of that, I would, I would highly recommend if you want to get into voice acting, take classes, invest your money into, like I said, your space first. Like your, your, I'm by, by space, I mean your recording space and invest money into classes and networking with directors and other voice actors. And be the kind of voice actor that is happy for other people when they get their roles and things. Be genuinely happy for people when they get a role or when they post about something on Twitter, genuinely mm -hmm. be excited for other people. And that will by far and away be one of the biggest things that helps you make connections with people. Of course. If, if you are, not, if you are complainy and the kind of person who's like, it should have been me, even in the back of your head, that's going to affect the way that you interact with people. So try your best to get out of that mindset we've all been there we jealousy is a normal thing especially in an industry like this we should have had to say but, that yeah but it's something you can work through you just need to actually want to work through it and like work past it yeah again we we all go through envy and jealousy it's a, it's a normal human emotion um my one of my credos is you can't you can't really control your emotions but you control your actions and your reactions to them so Correct. if you feel say let's say envious don't project it outward just kind of sit with it and being like if you again you could use it as a tool being like okay what are they what are they doing and how can i incorporate it into what i'm doing again it's a very slippery slope i'm just saying because it's very hard to say to not be jealous because again typical human emotion because we all go through that no matter what we do because again when you network and have friends someone's going to take off and i do think it's very important to say congratulations you deserved it yeah absolutely and uh to answer your question which i don't think i did uh, my dream role like of all time all time dream role would be to play in one of the seasons of critical roles Amazon Prime. Oh my god. Show. Yes. Um, they have a, you know what? If they do campaign two, a lot of goblins. Yeah, very true. <laughs> very true. Um that like just a dream to work with any of those people, that would be a dream role for me for sure. Especially Matthew Mercer. Especially Matthew Mercer. You know, it's it's fascinating how he is he has inspired an entire generation of people to want to do what he does. And I think part of that comes from just how genuinely passionate he is about it. Exactly. You can it, it like erupts from him every time you see him talk. He's, there's no ounce of fakeness in his body. And you can tell if you've ever looked up at Matthew Mercer's IMDb A billion times, yeah. He has voiced in all kinds of stuff that you had no idea he was a voice in because he just loves voice acting. Mm -hmm. He voiced in a freaking, uh, I, I don't remember what the name of the movie's called, but it's like this animated ripoff of Madagascar. Oh yeah, he posted about that on Twitter. He played like the evil elephant and he said he didn't even yeah. know what he was auditioning for. 
<laughs> yeah. And you know what? Like, it just goes to show his ego is is almost non-existent uh -huh. when it comes to those kind of things. I'm not going to say it's non-existent. I'm sure he would argue that he has his own type of ego. But if you interacted with him, and from the people I've heard who have interacted with him, he is a humble person. Yes. And that's important. Yes. We could all we could all learn from Matthew Mercer pretty much about everything. Yeah, I don't I don't mean to idolize him like he's some kind of angel. He's not perfect, just like everybody else. He's just a person that I think is is a worthy role model in my opinion. I worship him. It's fine. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's my show. When when eventually probably like episode fifty I have him on. My main question is when do you sleep? He does so much for, of course, Critical Role and all the voice acting. I'm like, dude, <laughs> when do you have time to just not be you for a second? Just chill. It's a fair question. <laughs> it's very it's very important. <laughs> God, I, I always talk about Matthew Mercer in this show just because he has a voice acting show. He's one of my main inspirations for starting this show. The main reason I started this show in my whole career in general was to interact with like people like you, other content creators. Because again, it can feel so isolating, especially when no one around you in your immediate life really gets it. So that's why yeah. I like like to talk to people like you and other friends I've made along the way and other creators just to get that kinship or companionship, I guess. Even though you're not gonna be friends with everybody, it's just like to, nice to talk, especially since what we've been talking we've been talking about the day about the mindset and the creation sphere and all that. So it's very nice to have that conversation on this show. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important to have connections with people who have shared interests, and this is a great way of doing that. Of course. So uh, I think we're about time. Uh, you can give your socials while we wind down. Just tell everyone where to find you and where to watch all your brilliant D&D &D stuff. <laughs> yeah, you can find me at Marcel Howard Jr. on everything. That's that's the name. Marcel Howard Jr. One L in Marcel. Now that's a brand. Uh, <laughs> Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, all that. Yep, Instagram, TikTok. Yep. And he's on Cast Call Club. If you guys ever want him on a roll, uh, first hand experience, he is amazing at direction. Honestly, if someone emailed me specifically, like, hey, Marcel, I heard you in this role, or like, I heard, your, I heard a recommendation from you from Saint or whatever, and. If I got an email that said that and like and it said, "Hey, I think your voice would be perfect for this thing," I would not care if you paid me. I would do it. <laughs> okay, don't 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 do that. <laughs> let's, let's still get you. Let's still get you paid. Don't undersell yourself. You're you're worth a lot. I paid you because I, I would knew be so flabbergasted. I would be so happy. Dude. <laughs> still get on. Go on the grind. Take that money because you need. You, you, you said you want to. You, you got to go where the talent is, and it takes money. <laughs> okay okay pay me but but i would definitely say yes to it uh uh just uh, you know very very few things would keep me from saying yes to you if you just told me like <laughs> hey i'm emailing you and specifically you for this role like that's just that's the dream for a voice actor all right well thank you so much for coming on marcel it's been my pleasure thanks for thanks for having me and uh you've got a great thing going here so i would recommend anyone who's a voice actor listening to this to contact you and and get on here and, and get some talking and, and, and network with you because you're a great director and uh you're you're just a good person to to know bro honestly i feel the same way about you like if you if you email me saying you want to be on this show i'll take you no matter what <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'll pay no 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 money exchanges hands i don't pay nobody all right if, if there's any doubt about that i don't pay these people no. they love no, me. i'm not paid to be here they love me they love the show they love talking about themselves which everyone does so <laughs> all right so that's been this episode of baby got booth we i'll see you all Whenever.